Mr. Price. Thank you, and my wife uh, reminded me I did not introduce myself. My name is Chuck Price. I'm a CFO of Young Manufacturing Company and here at Beaver Dam. So, just for curiosity, if I could, if you attended or graduated from Western Kentucky, could you stand up? If you, if you have family that graduated or attended Western Kentucky, could you stand up? That, that's a pretty good percentage. Okay, thank you. You may be seated. Welcome. Uh, before I introduce our guest today, I'd like to share a story that I believe is relevant to the subject matter. I was fortunate enough to have both grandfathers uh, who were college graduates. My maternal grandfather, uh, Earl Johnson, graduated from Center College with a double major in business and math, but this story has to do with my maternal grandfather. Uh, I recently came across a handwritten biography of my grandfather, Robert E. Price, and I'd like to share a summary with you if I could. <clears throat> Robert E. Price, born September 4th, 1895. Price Farm was located close to the Ohio County, McLean County line on Highway 136. I would say T.C. Sanford probably knows exactly where that is, as it's right in his neck of the woods. <laughs> Um, Robert Price received early training at Hillside School in McLean County and High School in Livermore. He entered Western Normal School in 1916, was drafted into the Army, and did his basic training at Camp Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, starting October 5th, 1917. He was transferred to Company K, 6th Infantry Regiment, 10th Infantry Brigade, on March 9, 1918, and left Hoboken, New Jersey to enter the World War I conflict. He fought in the Battle of St. Mihiel in France under the command of General George Pershing and against the German positions on September 15th, which was the last day of that battle. Uh, this conflict established the U.S. as a world power in the war. He was wounded in action on September 18, 1918, when a landmine went off in front of him. He sustained injuries from shrapnel in both legs, but the government made a mistake in their letter home. You see, instead of sending a letter home that he was wounded in action, they sent a letter home that he had been killed in action. The remainder, uh, he remained in the hospital until January 1st, 1919, when he boarded a transport for the U.S. and was then discharged after a month or two in hospitals at Camp Sherman, Ohio. His mother actually discovered that he was alive when, while doing the dishes in the kitchen, in the kitchen she heard his footsteps coming up the sidewalk. <clears throat> Robert Price re-entered Western Normal School in 1920, where he studied agriculture and played leather helmet football for at and he was a tough nut. He once played an entire football game in the Flying Bee with a broken clavicle. That's collarbone for non-medical people, but my wife <laughs> made me use clavicle. So. <coughs> in 1922, Western Normal School was renamed Western Kentucky State Normal School and Teachers College and started granting four-year degrees. My grandfather graduated on June 5th, 1924 with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture as part of his four-year degree class. Uh, his degree was confirmed 100 years ago this month. He taught agriculture and coached basketball in Greenville, Kentucky in 1924. Followed 1925, he was principal at a high school in Wildwood, Florida. The next seven years, he served as principal and vocational agriculture culture teacher in high schools in Linton, Kentucky, and then Breland, Kentucky. For the next 22 years, he was vocational agri agriculture teacher at Graham, Kentucky, Elkton, Kentucky, and then Hartford High School. During this period, he had three children. My father, Charles, attended Western Kentucky State College after serving in the Army during World War II. 
After graduation, he attended the University of Louisville School of Medicine and received his Doctor of Medicine and did his residency in Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio. <clears throat> My Uncle Ronnie attended Western Kentucky State College after serving in the Army as well. After graduating, he attended the University of Louisville School of Dentistry where he received his Doctor of Medical Dentistry. My Aunt Ann attended the University of Kentucky after graduating, she attended the University of Louisville School of Medicine, where she received her doctor of medicine. She did her residency in radiology, pediatric radiology, and neuroradiology at Duke University, and was the first woman to be accepted into a fellowship in neuroradiology at Vanderbilt University. She spent her career in academia as a professor at the University of Louisville, Vanderbilt University, University of Virginia, State University of New York and finished her career as a professor of neuroradiology at Harvard University. Robert Price had six grandchildren. Of the six, five graduated with bachelor's degrees and one with an associate degree. My oldest sister received her bachelor's degree in accounting from WKU, received her CPA, and then received her MBA from WKU. My other two sisters and I received bachelor's degrees in computer science from Western Kentucky. My cousin Rhonda received a bachelor's degree in computer science from Southeast Missouri State University and is currently an engineer at Boeing Aviation. Additionally, my wife Vanessa received a BS in chemistry and a master's in nursing from WKU. Of his 10 great-grandchildren, seven have bachelor's degrees one will receive her bachelor's degree in 2025, and the other two have earned college hours toward their degrees. You see, the reason I felt that this was important to the conversation today is because Western Kentucky University changed my family tree. My grandfather passed away a few months before I was born, that my life and that of my family was made better because of the determination, his determination to get a college education. My grandfather was the first of the Price family to earn a college degree and the only one of his four siblings. My grandfather and father both valued education and appreciated and loved Western Kentucky University. My father many times stated the best investment he could make in his children was an education. But my story isn't unique. Western Kentucky University and the other colleges and higher education institutes have changed many lives of many individuals in this region and continue to today. <coughs> Our guest speaker today is Dr. Timothy Caboni, President of Western Kentucky University. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Caboni in the winter of 2017 was when my son was a prospective student visited at WKU. I noticed a very sharp dressed gentleman <laughs> making his way up the line of students and parents waiting to get in uh, to one of the big class buildings for meetings. He approached us, introduced himself as Dr. Timothy Cavalli, president of Western Kentucky University, and spoke with us for several minutes. And then he went on up the line. Uh, we went on into the building, had our, had our meetings, and when we came out, Dr. Cavalli was still greeting individuals in, in, the, in the corridor. But as I discussed our, our surprise at meeting Dr. Pony, as we assumed that a college president wouldn't take the time for a prospective student uh, visit. But I learned a lot about Dr. Pony that day. He's a hard worker who doesn't miss an opportunity to represent his university. He genuinely loves Western Kentucky University and the students that he serves. He's a very interesting person with a diverse background. He's kind, personable, and you leave a conversation, conversation feeling truly heard as he fully engages with you. Henry Harden Cherry coined the phrase, the spirit makes the master. If this is true, WKU is in excellent shape with Dr. Gaboni. Please join me in welcoming Western Kentucky's 10th president, Dr. Timothy Gaboni. Goodness gracious, I can sit down now, I guess. Um, uh, you know, we like to think about ourselves as an institution of 
of opportunity and access. That's what Henry Hardin Cherry built WKU for. And what you heard is a story about a family whose life's trajectory has changed. Um, and that is just as true today as it was in 1906, that fully a third of our students are their first in their families to go to college. And by getting that college degree, they change the trajectory of their lives, the lives of their families and their families to come, and their communities. And I hope, in some small measure, the Commonwealth. And so, you know, folks sometimes ask, what's it like to be a college president? Well, on some days, it's really cool. And that's when you get to hang out with students, where you get to go watch a homecoming parade. There are other days that are a bit more challenging, like going to visit with the legislature um, or dealing with faculty. But every morning, I wake up, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to leave the university. University that was important in my life, in my career. I'm a 1994 graduate. Um, but also uh, understanding that the work we do is so crucial to the future of our Commonwealth. That we must, as a state and as a nation, educate students and continue to grow them. It's, it's essential for the future of our economy, for the future of our workforce. Um, and that story that you just heard is repeated over and over and over again. And that's why I think what a, what a great privilege it is for me to invest my life in higher education. It's been the most rewarding thing I've done in 35 years uh, now. I'm going into my eighth year at the university, which I can't believe. Um, and I've learned a couple of things. Uh, number one, I'm Italian. I like to talk with my hands, but I also like to walk around. You've got a camera looking at me today, so I can't walk. So if I'm flailing my arms around, sorry about that. My wife says, come on, Capone, can't you just hang, hang on to the podium more? <laughs> the other uh, thing you learn is uh, you can't do your job without tremendous support. Um, it's not about being president. It's actually about a team of people who help the presidency exist. And uh, Judy, I want to congratulate you on your retirement. And uh, as they say around campus, um, he runs his mouth and we run everything else. So I know who actually runs the ship. <laughs> Uh, congratulations on that and uh, enjoy what, what is to come. Um, I'm thankful for the support I've had in my career. I know that you can't do uh, as a leader what you need to do uh, without the support of amazing uh, staff. So congratulations, Judy. Uh, so Chuck stole my thing. I was going to have everybody stand up, but I already, he already did it. So I'm just going to skip to talking about what we've been working on uh, at the university. Obviously, we have deep roots. Uh, here in Ohio County. Uh, you will remember, some of you, uh, I was here uh, just a few years ago when we visited all 27 counties in our service region over the course of the summer on the big red road trip. Um, I asked Jennifer in about the third week of us driving from barbecue shop to barbecue shop, whose idea was this? And she's like, well, it was yours. <laughs> so I can't complain. Um, but what a wonderful experience to learn about from where our students come. And I remember in particular a story of a county that had lost its last grocery store. I'm sitting in town uh, with the, the newspaper, and he shares with me, well, if we want to make groceries, we've got to either go north to the Walmart, or we've got to go south to the county just to our south. And then you realize the importance of not just education, but of workforce and economic development to the future of all of our counties, of all of our counties. And so I, I'm proud of what's happening in Bowling Green, I'm proud of what's happening in Warren County, but it elevates all of us. There are the hands again. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've done for students, um, but I also wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing for the regional economy. So first of all, um, you all should be very proud of the performance of your students. Uh, they retained at 88.9% first year to second year. And we bring about 35 to 40 students from Ohio County every year uh, to WKU. That's tremendous success. We've been focusing on that retention rate, setting a goal of 80% retention, 60% graduation, which is on par with public flagships across this nation. And I'm proud to report um, that we, this fall, will hit that 80% mark. So Alex, uh, who's the principal here, thank you for your hospitality. And, Congratulations on the students that you prepare. They are excellent 
excellent students. Now, how have we done this? And, and Suzanne and I were talking before about how, do, how have you moved your retention rate from 72% to essentially 80% in seven years, really six if you, if you think about it. Well, we've done it by meeting our students where they are. So I want to make sure every young person, no matter their background, or no matter the economic condition to which they were born, that they feel like they found their people. And they can do that in lots of different ways. But we know we have to serve different students differently. Uh, so if, if I come from downtown Louisville or downtown Nashville, I've had a really different experience than somebody who came from rural Kentucky. But well, we're going to meet both of those folks where they are so that they find their people and they feel supported in their academic programs. Folks who come from economic conditions that are tough, they have different sets of needs. If you don't have a family member who's ever been to college, we use all of this weird language that, that makes no sense. Like what does drop a class actually mean? If you haven't been to college, doesn't mean you don't know what that means. We finally changed the name of the Bursar's office. That's the bill collection, right? So but we use all these crazy names, what's a provost? So helping make the institution more accessible, more understandable from the moment students show up on campus. But we also want to get smaller, faster, and connect the 15 to 18 hours inside the classroom to the 140 outside of the classroom. So uh, some of you may have known, we built something called the First Year Village. Uh, we took down Bemis Lawrence and Barnes Campbell Hall, the old cruciform uh, dorms that were still there in 2017. Imagine that. You're all fortunate for the future students in the room not to have to live there. Um, we got more work to do to build the other half of that first year village. But I didn't want to just replace buildings. Uh, so what we built uh, was a set of pods. And within that pod, our students have a shared academic interest or social interest. They live with 23 other first year students instead of 3,000 with a peer advisor who shares that interest and then a faculty member that hopefully advises and teaches many of them in the fall and spring. So all of a sudden, if you're challenged with something in the classroom, you can go meet your faculty member, but you already know them because you meet that faculty member before classes even begin. But you also have students who are taking the same courses alongside you. The retention rate of students in the living learning communities is a full six percentage points higher than those who don't participate and um, fully a third of our students now choose to be in an LLC and that's going up to 50% over the next several years. Um, it is a remarkable success story. Now, only about 10% of Ohio County students participated out of 37 last fall, so we want to make sure that folks who see that as an opportunity to get to participate and we do it as well as we possibly can. Uh, we focused on first generation students, uh, like a laser engaging over 500 first year first gen students in that in that first year helping them overcome challenges but also showing them other folks that have done what they're going to try to do and so we have 75 80 faculty members they were the first in their families to go to college they went through and got phds they work at wku because they believe in our mission and they sit down with these young people and say hey i did it i know you can do it what a great kind of story or message to send to them. Now, I'm gonna argue WK is a little bit different than other institutions. I know our scholarship winner is going to that blue and yellow place down the, across the bridge. You can't win them all, even though I want to win them all. Um, uh, but I will say, uh, you know, we're a Goldilocks institution. Not too big, not too small, but just right. Um, and what we do um, is create an undergraduate experience uh, that I argue is second to none in the Commonwealth. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about our future and where we're headed um, that's going to differentiate us even more against uh, some of our competition uh, in, in the state. But one of the things I want to share is that we really focus on folks being able to take what they learn in the classroom and apply it in the real world. So we have this beautiful 900 acre farm, all contiguous land, that young people come in and I learned not just about the importance of the farm, but of FFA um, is one of the first things that I did when I came to campus. And FFA in its creed has a line that goes like this, learning to do and doing to learn. 
And I want every student on our campus, the ag student, the meteorology student, our engineers, to not just have classroom learning. They need to be able to take that and apply it in the real world. Look, every engineering student that graduates from WKU will have a job before they graduate. Now, it's not because they do calculus well. They do calculus. You want uh, your students in engineering to be good at calculus. There was a reason I was a speech and rhetoric major. Um, but you also want them to be able to get their boots dirty, to get out to the real world, to work on job sites, to be able to take the ideas that they learn in the classroom and put them into action, to take that knowledge that they're experienced theoretically and make it useful in the real world. We want every one of our students to be able to do that. Now, we're growing our research portfolio. I set the goal last convocation uh, that we were going to double our research expenditures in the next five years. We're going to double our federal investment in R&D in the next five years, going from 10 to $20 million in federal dollars invested in 20 to 40 in expenditures. But it's about more than that. Uh, we grew last year, we had a 20% growth rate in our federal dollars. I just learned we have a tremendous new federal grant um, from the Department of Education around preparing teachers through an apprenticeship program. But what's important is what this creates for our university, for our region, and for our economy. So I'm gonna back up. 20 years ago, uh, the judge of uh, Warren County, uh, Judge Buchanan, had this, what many people thought was a harebrained idea, to create something called the Trans Park. To pay, you know, 100 acres or more, and put them all in one parcel and use it to attract manufacturing to our region. There's a reason Bowling Green continues to be the fastest growing city, fastest growing county, fastest growing region in the Commonwealth, and that's because of that vision. Um, we have 4,000 open jobs in Bowling Green. If you need a job, or you have I, I know you all have openings too, we're all competing against each other. Um, we need more people with more degrees, but that transpark transformed the university that I attended in 1994 and the community that I spent time in. Well, the transpark is full. And we don't have another 200 acres to attract manufacturing with, and we're kind of out of electricity, and don't tell anybody that. Uh, but if we have lots of challenges with infrastructure. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, we've created something called the Innovation Campus. Um, it's just south of the main campus on Nashville Road. Uh, some of you probably will refer to it as the Old Mall. Please don't do that anymore. It's our Innovation Campus, and what are we doing? Well, we're creating spaces where companies can relocate and co-locate with our faculty. Um, we've attracted six new companies focused on AI, big data and data sciences, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence to the innovation campus. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that for the future of Bowling Green in our region, we have to diversify our economy. And so I hope in 20 years we look back and say, look at the amazing development we've had that's diversified our economy, that focuses on healthcare data, for one, automotive engineering, another, big data and data sciences, for a third, all of which provides jobs for our region, better paying jobs for our region, and economic development that's really important for the continued growth of Bowling Green and Warren County. But we also, are going to transform our institution while we do this. And so some of you may have been paying attention during the last legislative session um, where we proposed that WKU be allowed to offer five PhD programs in very narrow ways. Um, this is not a history PhD or an English PhD. Those are fine. But I want that blue place and that other red place to do that. We don't want to be a research one university, which is what Louisville and Kentucky are. But we do want to and will be a research two institution in the coming years. Kentucky does not have an R2 university, but every state that touches Kentucky does. And that's a, a gap in what we can do for our economy. When you look at the towns that had that kind of investment and how they transform the economies, we're gonna do that through federal research funding, company relocation, growing our student base, and offering a very narrow set of PhDs, which is the workforce for those companies we're getting to co-locate. We essentially are becoming, for better or for worse, Nashville North. The number of students who can commute back and forth, uh, the number of folks who work in Nashville and live in Bowling Green or to 
places south, but more importantly, we have an opportunity for companies that are being incubated in Nashville, who are tired of Nashville and all that entails, who want a different kind of life but want access to that. And so we have a, a set of, I'm not going to name them, they'll be very glad I'm not going to name them, we have a set of companies that we're trying to get uh, to Bowling Green to con continue to diversify that economy and then also support startup companies um, and others in the region. Uh, so that's the future, uh, the transformation of the institution. Um, one last thing, I've got to thank the legislature uh, for their investment in higher education. Suzanne, thank you for being here as, as a legislator, um, but also uh, for everyone else who sees the value of higher education at transforming our economy. Um, if, you, if you have not been to campus in a while, I, I encourage you to come, park your car, don't park in Egypt, park at the top of the hill, for those of you who remember the parking lot called Egypt, the bottom of the hill, that flooded all the time. Um, and you will see a complete transformation that continues. Um, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, but I'm really proud of the almost half billion dollars in construction we've done over the past seven years. Uh, not only we do the new first year village, we took down Tate Page Hall, the round building you could never get, get out of if you got lost. Um, and we're replacing that now with a new uh, building for our Gordon Ford College of Business, a building that will create applied learning spaces for all of our programs within the facility. It's on the old footprint of uh, Tate Page Hall, right there on South Lawn by Guthrie Tower. Um, if you think about uh, just across the street where our football facilities are, uh, we broke ground uh, last, last fall on a hilltop or a field house project and the press box. Uh, the press box will open this fall, next fall, the field house, which sounds like it's for sports, but it's kind of for marching band. We have the biggest marching band in the state and it's their future home. Um, we also have the best speech and debate forensics program in the country who wins national championships over and over again. They're gonna go in there. Esports, which is a new academic competitive area, uh, will be located there and we'll let the football team and baseball team use the practice space too. Uh, so I hope you'll see that work continuing. Um, we took down the Garrett Conference Center. I know many people said I ruined their lives because they had met their significant other at a dance or some concert in Garrett. I'm sorry for that, but uh, we renovated our commons. And so if you've not been to the old Helm Library, I encourage you to go see it. Um, when I showed up, I went to the library and it looked just like the library I had visited in 1994. And uh, went to the, the basement, which was the government document section, and it looked like, it smelled just like 1994. And so I, I got the, li the dean of libraries to come together, and I said, all right, why do we have all this paper here? Isn't this all digitized? She's like, well, yeah. Like, okay, well, think with me for a minute. What if we had coffee in the library? Are you okay with that? She's like, well, sure. What do you think about snacks? We have snacks, and she's like, well, you know, food, books, it doesn't really go together. I'm like, well, think with me for a minute. What if we put a food court in the basement of the library? Just come on, you want to turn my library into a food court? Kind of. Uh, but what we've created is a tremendous third space on our campus. Imagine this, at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night, we have to have folks walking around the library asking young people to go back to their dorm rooms because they're in there using the library that much. It is a tremendous space. The bottom is a food court. Uh, the main area has a Spencer's Coffee, for those of you who know Spencer's Coffee in Bowling Green. Um, it's essentially the largest uh, coffee shop in the, in the state, um, and certainly in Bowling Green. And then upstairs does feel like a library. So go see that. But what we did with Garrett coming down was transform uh, the hilltop. Um, and so we called it our Hilltop Restoration Project, bringing the top of the hill back to what President Cherry and our founding architects wanted. I'm very excited to, to have it more uh, accessible, but be able to walk, um, but also a place where students can, can pause, reflect, stop right behind Cherry Hall, which will be completely renovated starting 25. And we have, thanks to the legislature, the largest capital investment in the university's history, $160 million for our academic complex. So with that, I invite you to come spend some time with us. I know many of you do. Um, if you're coming for a, a sporting event, Come a little early and see what else we have going on. There's lots of lots of amazing things happening. Um, and with that, a couple minutes for questions. Yes. I hear a lot of like innovation and future, all those sorts of conversations are happening, right? So as a leader, how are you waiting that fine line between
upholding tradition, but also pushing the status quo in a way that leads to students that are prepared for 21st century? So traditions are crucially important. The red tower, the best mascot in the country, Big Red, um, fight song, spirit makes the master. We cannot lose sight of the things that bind us to the institution and bond us across generations to one another. At the same time, if we keep doing what we're doing today, we will be a failure in five to 10 years. We must think differently about what we're creating for our students. And so uh, they don't know this yet, but at convocation this year, I'm gonna challenge our computer science faculty, our business faculty, to think about how it is they create a school of data sciences that takes into account data, big data, AI, virtual reality, computer science, all the things you've heard me talk about out on the innovation campus. And so my job as a leader is to really both look around a corner and see what's coming next and make sure we're being responsive and proactive. And at the same time, uh, to push our faculty. And look, universities are wonderful at pattern maintenance, doing next year the same thing that we did last year. And we cannot think that way any longer. Uh, one of the most important things that I did in my first couple of years was create a decentralized budget model. Now that is the least sexy thing that you can do as a university president. I'm so excited about our new budget model. Why? Because every one of our deans knows that their job is absolute, and their college's budget is absolutely dependent upon their success at recruiting students and graduating students, getting federal research dollars, and creating graduate programs. So there's a great formula. And for every student who takes a course or, or majors in your college, your budget goes up. I had a dean when I first showed up when we were having a conversation around how they were going to grow enrollment because, well, it was Potter College and their enrollment had been going down for about a decade. And he said, well, that's not my job. That's, that's the marketing and enrollment management people's job. He's not dean anymore. Um, we have a new dean who understands, no, that absolutely is his job. Connects to his budget, but we have to be innovative, right? And so I want every person on our campus focused on recruiting, retaining, and graduating students. That's job one. I don't care what you do. You can be a custodian. You can work in food service. You can be in academic administration. But your job is to make sure we recruit, enroll, and graduate our students and help them get successful lives. So part of it is setting that tone and changing culture. Uh, part of it is pushing folks that sometimes don't want to be pushed. But the other is, is thinking around the corner about what comes next and how can we skate to where the puck's going to be, not to where it is. <laughs> I get that question more than you might imagine. Um, I would say answer the way Casey answers, which is more than enough, too many, and uh, no more. Uh, a lot. It's embarrassing. Well, with that, thank you so much for all you do for our university. For our current students, some who are here, we're glad to have you finishing up and graduating soon for our, our Prospective students, eighth grade, five more, we, we go to football games together, five more years to be on the hill here. Uh, thank you for being just a wonderful supporter of the community. I'm glad to be here. And go Tops! Those. So everybody get your little white tickets out. 
Whitney is going to draw them out for me. And our first one is to Sarah's Boutique. Sarah's Boutique. It's a $25 gift certificate. And our numbers are going to be the last four, seven, eight, nine, three. Oh, Jolene Johnson. Okay. Here we go. Yep. Take it. I need one of our chambers. Here, Chuck, you come up here. You can be a runner. We've got to have a runner to take the prizes. We've got to have someone to hold our new ticket jar. It's heavy. It's a big guy. It is. So for People's Bank, they have purchased a Bryce Drugs gift certificate. We love Bryce Pharmacy's gift shop. 7894. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and our next gift certificate is to the Thank you. Pizza, pizza place, and that is going to go to the twenty-five dollar gift certificate to seven eight eight seven. And no. Okay, and then the last generous gift certificate from People's Bank. And thank you for purchasing those. Thank you for um, for purchasing locally. Uh, Los Amigos Restaurant, and that's going to go to seven nine two eight. Uh, come on up here, girl. Get your jar. Get your Lots of windows. Chuck, you're doing an excellent job, sir. No, we got, we got more. We need to check those up. Okay. And we also have donated to us from the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Ridge Celebration um, from the Ohio County Tourism two tickets to the Jamie... No, two, two four-day passes. So that's going to go to 7917. How many people here have been to Jerusalem Ridge for the festival? That's a, that's a good time. 7917. Take my ticket. Draw another one. You lose. 7912. Oh, there you go. Okay. And our very last one today is two tickets donated by the Ohio County Tourism. And this one actually is for the Jamie Johnson concert. I, I apologize, it's actually provided by the Beaverdale Tourism. So thank you, Beaverdale Tourism, for that. And that is going to be 7879. Seven eight seven nine. Is that you, sir? Okay. Well, you can make three down to a result. So thank you to both of our tourism groups. Thank you for the There's a lot of progress today. Um, Jeannie, would you like to say a few words? Oh, uh, she's going to. Um, when Judy is finished, she's going to join us back here at the back table. We hope that everyone will stop on their way out and wish her well. Grab one of the delicious cookies made from one of our local bankers and. Um, Tell her thank you, just like um, we all have done. I just want to say thank you for 12 years. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed the time back in the county and serving Ohio County. Having been born and raised here, my children grew up here. Well, no, they really didn't. They grew up in Davis County. <laughs> but uh, also, I will have to say I have a couple of graduate uh, attendees at Western Kentucky this year. In fact, one had to leave just now to go back and take an exam. <laughs> and then my daughter also graduated from Western Kentucky several years ago, and I have one from that other school down the other end of the campus. <laughs> but I'm glad two of my girls are here, three of my grandchildren are here, and I just appreciate so much you all honoring me, and uh, I'll be around. It's been, it's, been, it's been a great 12 years. I, I had no intention of doing this for 12 years when I retired the first time. <laughs> Thank you. your way out, throw it on your laptop or on your water bottle, and thank you for coming today.